House administration held a procedure. The procedure was that if you wanted to propose House rules, you would go to them. There was an actual hearing. They were listened to, reviewed, and I believe all of you got a published uh, of that. And I'm, I'm not sure about the newly elected members, but the members got published. So you would have access to it as well. So today we're presenting, and just to let you know the base rules, we're taking Rule 16 out. What that means is COVID. We put in a lot of pandemic rules, and those are being taken out. Just so you know, there are procedures where you can go through House administration on a health or a safety issue. So it's not like we can't look at those again in the future. In addition, there were some clerical changes to make sure that we've done things administratively and dating. We had to update the dates in the rules. And as many of you know, these rules, because we didn't operate normally during the coronavirus, uh, we weren't able to really get into our rules as much. And they were vented and vetted and went through. So basically, you have a house rule procedure that has been researched, reviewed twice, and are ready to go. Now the procedure is, I'm going to present these rules, and then there will be amendments that are proposed. And for the new members, we will be, people will be asking you to vote yes or no, and you'll just have to make that your decision. But I want you to know that is the basis, that is the package, that's what you have online, and that is what has been printed. So, Mr. Speaker, in sake of time, because many of the members have gone through this, I then will go forward with the amendment process. The following amendment, the clerk will read the amendment. Amendment by Hunter. The chair recognizes Mr. Hunter to explain the amendment. All right, now members, and thank you, Mr. Speaker, I want you to pay very close attention as I explain this amendment. This is what is called an absence amendment. And what this says, and if you follow it, and I know some have been printed and some are online, but let me hit some of the points. If a member is absent without leave for the purpose of impeding the action of the House, the member is subject to one or more of the following. One, fines and that is defined in the rule. Two, payment of costs incurred by the sergeant at arms. That's explained in this amendment. Reprimand proceeding, censor proceeding, and expulsion. Unless the House, and that's you, all 150 of us, excuses the fine payment by a majority vote, each member who is absent without leave is liable to the House as follows. A fine in the amount of $500 for each calendar day of absence. And the member's pro rata share of the costs incurred by the sergeant at arms to secure attendance. It also explains that the Committee on House Administration shall notify the member of the total amount of fines and costs for which the payment is not excused. A member must pay the amount stated in the committee's notice by making payment in that amount to the House Business Office not later than the third business day of the first calendar month after the date of the committee's notice. And this I want you to be clear. 
a member may not make any payment from funds in the member's operating account or funds accepted as political contributions, and the legal section is provided. If a member does not make full payment as required, the committee shall direct the House Business Office to reduce the amount of the monthly credit to the member's operating account established under the housekeeping resolution by 30% in each month that any amount of a fine remains past due and owing. When a member makes full payment as required, the committee shall direct the business office, House Business Office, to restore the impounded funds to the member's operating account subject to any limitations. Then there is an expulsion provision. And before a member is expelled under this section, the matter shall be referred to the Committee on House Administration for, admi for basically investigation and report. A report is issued under this subsection. So you basically have a process that members would go through. So this is an amendment that I am proposing to the House rules, and I want to make a final comment, and then I'll take questions. For your information, our research shows historically authorized procedures for absences without leave are arrest, apologies to the House, censor and reprimand, deductions from pay, expulment, expulsion, and payment of the costs of arrest. So we have looked at this from the legal side, and we feel that this answers some of the questions that have been raised. And so, Mr. Speaker, I move adoption and we'll take questions. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Martinez Fisher, for what purpose? The gentleman yield for some questions. Would the gentleman yield for questions? Yes. The gentleman yields. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Chairman Hunter. Uh, Chairman Hunter, just a, just a couple of things for awareness. Uh, you and I first spoke about this this morning. Is that correct? Correct. And just you know, for the purposes of our conversation, uh, I believe I may have engaged you personally sometime around the first week or so in December, inquiring about this very topic. Does that sound right? I don't know when, but you have reached out. Right, and, and you were very kind to respond, and I appreciate that. And if I could just sort of summarize your response, you were, well, um, I don't really know much about rules. Uh, and then you reminded me, because you're a little bit senior to me, you reminded me that until we had a speaker, we really didn't have any rules to discuss or a process by which we would go by adopting those rules. Does that sound correct? No. Okay. I never told you I didn't know about rules. Oh. I think I know about rules. Um, what I told you is, is that we had a contested speaker's election and we needed to elect a speaker so the speaker could announce a calendar which has been fairly well followed in the same manner. So for with that clarification, uh, I probably agree with you. I, I appreciate that, and just for the purposes of the record and people who know you, I, you don't talk that way. So I, I don't know if those were the words you used, but, but I, I accept the spirit of, of your response, and I appreciated you responding at all. It was over the Christmas holidays, and you were kind enough to, to do a little bit of business while we were celebrating the holidays. I was able to get my hands on this about, you know, about 10 a.m., and that's pretty close in time when you were able to get your hands on this. Yes. You know, we published the House rules yesterday, and as in regular procedure, everybody has ideas, thoughts, their concepts, and we were on the phone pretty much through the night and then this morning, and so I submitted and got my copy around 9. Okay. And, and uh, is, it, is it your intent that with regard to this section of the rules, this is the only concept that we're going to be entertaining today by way of having a debate and a, a vote to adopt this rule? Well, I can't speak for the other 149, but 
This is the Todd Hunter proposal. Yes, sir. And, and if it is a Todd Hunter proposal, uh, any proposal that would be near second place to the Todd Hunter proposal would, would uh, not be acceptable to the presenter of House Rule 4 or House I'll, Resolution 4? I'll give you that answer when they're proposed. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, looking at it, the body of it, I'm on page one and I'm looking at line 14, specifically line 12. Uh, when I read this, it says if a member is absent without leave. Uh, and, and so that, that anticipates events, not just a quorum break, but any unauthorized leave by anybody for anything at any time. Well, if you read the full D, and everybody should see this, if a member is absent without leave for the purpose of impeding the action of the House. Sure. So yes, it's not going to be just for one event. There may be other scenarios, and not to bore the body, but we've talked about other scenarios by which there may be an unauthorized leave that the purpose of this rule might trigger, uh, but you know the overall conduct may not rise to the level of a quorum break, and, and I think there was a, an acknowledgment of that. So my, my question, uh, Mr. Chairman, is oftentimes in committee, uh, would this rule apply to proceedings in committee? Well, I mean, if the member gets reprimanded, gets censored, gets expelled, or gets fined, that could impede completely their operation. So specifically, if we're in a committee, you know, typically there are nine, and we have a couple of excused absences, uh, and then a member is on a second committee, or a member's laying out a bill, or a member's with a constituent, uh, or a member maybe, you know, meeting with other colleagues and caucuses and so forth. If there's, let's say there isn't a quorum in committee, uh, could any member of this body accuse another member of impeding the business of the House because the committee can't function? The intent of the rule is for somebody who actually intentionally tries to impede action of the state's business. And no. that's why that's clarified. I appreciate I would, that. I would hope that the members, all 150, would work together to realize if there was an intentional act or somebody was ill, that's not what this is talking about. As somebody is uh, incapacitated, that's not what this is talking about. Yes, sir. And I'll, and I'll certainly ask the chair if he would recognize me to reduce these remarks to writing after we visit. But. I don't see the words intentional uh, in, on page one, line 12, and I understand the practice of the House, a practice I desire, which is to work together. Uh, I know that we've only had a couple of votes here and we have not thrown up 150 in one direction yet. So there could be a member who d reads the rule and wants to lodge and be recognized Outside of the power of recognition that the speaker has to acknowledge the member for that motion, I just want to make sure that this rule is not going to punish people on committee. We've been in committees where there just is the chairperson alone, sometimes taking testimony, and I don't want to, someone to say, well, there are right. those members impeding the business of the House. Let, let me clarify. This rule is the House floor. This isn't committee. Committees set up their own procedures. This only applies to attendance on the House floor. Okay. When you get into your committee proceedings, that's your chairman, your vice chairman, and your members. So we're talking about this is a House rule for House procedures. So this, so everybody knows, this is attendance on the House floor. This is where you conduct, conduct the business. You have committee business. This is House business. And I, and I appreciate that. And it's I'm glad we're having that exchange. But is there a page and line number that you can point to that tells me this is specific to the floor proceedings? It's a do all the language in the amendment is incorporated in the House rules, which is specifically referencing House proceedings. Yes, sir. And there are many rules in the House rules that pertain to specific behavior of the committees sure. and the functions of committees. and. Moreover, there are the times where you can raise points of order in committees, uh, and so I, I, if this is just limited to the floor proceedings, perhaps we might want to 
put a comma and a couple of words in there to, to make that expressly understood, just so that we don't have somebody taking matters into their own hands, thinking that they could use this in a committee setting or some other setting that's not on the House floor. I think it's drafted correctly. The lawyers have looked at it. It's plugged in. I think you can take my word and the writing that this is attendance on the House floor. Committee proceedings, to me, are different. They're under the rules, but this is dealing to attendance, House floor. Okay, and then I, I, I will certainly take you at your word, and I will put that up to the body. Uh, I think it doesn't sure. take a lot to add those words. There are capable men and women there to assist us to get that in writing. Maybe somebody's already drafting it. Uh, but, but since we are on our word, I also take you at your word that this document was produced, this document was produced uh, and given to us at a very late stage in, in today's proceedings and that you did not have the occasion to, to work with others in, in crafting it. This was just something that, that, that appeared the way things do and I understand that and that we're working to make it better as you and I debate today. No, I don't agree with you. Gentleman's time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm moved to extend. Is there objection to extension of time? Chair, here's none. Time's extended. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I don't agree with you. Um, the proceedings have been going on since House administration held hearings last fall. There have been members talking about this topic. There have been members discussing about this topic. I have been in the hearings listening. This amendment is Todd Hunter. This is listening to members, all sides. When we file the rules, guess what? When you file a bill, you get reaction. And this isn't anything abnormal. Members, when you get ready to file your bills, you're gonna hear a lot of things within 24 hours of your committee hearing or sometimes even faster. So this isn't anything unusual. The essence is talking to members and yes, did we get a product? Did I ask this to be looked at? Yes. And when I got it, I passed it to folks and let them know and have tried to discuss this on the floor. But I don't think there's any more hurried up on this rule than we've done on other matters. Yes, sir, and, and thank you for that. And I, I'm just trying to establish for the purposes of us being able to work together uh, that, that we have a process in place by which we engage in dialogue and try to get things done. And sometimes that happens in a meeting and sometimes it happens here on the House floor, but we're all trying to work to get to a place. We all have to operate under these rules. Is that right, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Okay. And as you and I say, being from South Texas, Trabajando juntos hacemos las cosas. For those that don't know that's working together, we'll get things done. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Martinez, special court purpose. Mr. Speaker, I move that uh, we reduce the exchange between Chairman Hunter and myself. If we can reduce them to write and place them in the Journal of the House, except for the Spanish. <laughs> Members, you heard the motion striking the last part about Spanish. Is there objection? Chair, here's none. Motion is adopted. Mr. Smithy, for what purpose? Uh, will the gentleman yield? The gentleman yield for questions. Uh, Mr. Hunter, I, 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 the way I read subsection, subsection D is that there are five uh, potential, th one or more of these five things can be done in case of um, basically a quorum break. Is that your understanding? Yes. Now, my question, and I didn't find this in the, in the bill, in the amendment, is who makes that determination? The uh, body this house body okay uh it and doesn't then if say you that appeal it if you appeal, well no it's incorporated in the sections up here john but well this house body it would come before because it's the attendance here and then let's say a ruling was made by this body a majority if that member wants to challenge they would then go to house administration well th what you have are going to have is the lack of a quorum and so, have you, have you looked at the issue of whether a lack of quorum can take the action that's envisioned in this, in this legislation? Yes, yes okay. we have. 
Well, as I read it, the only thing that, that happens, the only thing it addresses is expul is, are the fines and the expulsion. And uh, basically, those would be considered by House administration, but there's, no, there's nothing in here about whether or how it would be referred to the House, uh, the full House, and, and who would have an opportunity to vote. For example, uh, would the expulsion vote be the remaining members that were here who lack a quorum, or would it be later on when the absent members had returned? Well, first of all, sections one and two would be ongoing. There would be nothing impeding that. They would continue. If you have a quorum break, one and two continue. And that doesn't stop. In connection with expulsion, a lot of the expulsion rules are tied into the Constitution, as you know. And you could follow some constitutional rules. On reprimand and censor, I can't second guess what the request would be. Uh, you know, if somebody wanted to come up here and make that motion and make it a hard, hard censor motion, a hard reprimand, I can't answer you because I don't know what it would be. But yes, I'm not, I don't think it would necessarily stop everything. Well, one question I have is if it's just a motion, if it's a procedure by the remaining members with the absence of a quorum, would it be a privileged motion that the speaker would be required to recognize, or would it be in the speaker's discretion whether to, uh, to uh, uh, recognize that member? I think recognition of the member is always going to be by the speaker. By, in discretionary with the speaker? Well, I think it's either way. I mean, the speaker is going to have to call on you to go to the back microphone uh, okay. to request okay. a censor or reprimand. Was there any consideration given by you or any a discussion that concerned the removal of committee cha chairs who were intentionally absent from the House for the purpose of impeding a quorum? Was it discussed? The answer is yes. However, there are proposals that are actually specific to that, which I understand are going to be proposed today. But, but I do think those are different type procedures, but there's sometimes maybe some likeness. Okay, thank you. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Dutton, for a purpose. Does the gentleman yield? Does the gentleman yield for questions? Yes. The gentleman yields. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, let me start by asking does the House, can the House transact any business without a quorum? Under the Constitution, well, are you talking formal action on the floor? Can the House transact any business on the floor other than to adjourn without a quorum? I don't think so. I, don't, I think you're, but that, sections one and two are automatic, so those, those happen whether we're on the floor or not. If if there is a quorum right. Well, it, it, as I understand what you just told Chairman Smithy, if the violations will be determined by the House floor, right? Yes. By the House members on the floor. That's what it says. Well, how can they conduct any business except to adjourn if the Constitution prescribes that you don't get to conduct any business except by virtue of a quorum? Number one and number two are automatic. If you I'm not MP, sure what you mean by automatic. Tell me what that means. Well, it fines. Those fines accumulate each day. You but there has break. to be a, but there has to be a determination made that there was a violation before a fine can be imposed. Well, they're gonna. It, let's just say this: when that point in time occurs, which is the day you leave, the day you come back, those days will be accumulated. Well, but, but, but somebody has to make the determination that a person was absent without leave for the purpose of impeding the action. That is the House, and you're correct. Constitution says if we're not here, you can't conduct business without following the Constitution. But right. when you do get the people back, these automatically flow. So if they never came back, you would never have to, this never yeah, would be We wouldn't be have imposed. a legislature. You would never right. impose this. Yeah. Is that what is that what if the voters want you never to come back? 
No, no, I'm, I'm asking about the process. No, no, you just said if you imposing. never came back and you didn't have two thirds, we couldn't conduct. We couldn't conduct any business. Okay, so none of this would take effect until an absent members of a quorum. I mean, the absent members that defeated a quorum came back to the house. Okay, I don't understand your question. Well, yeah, my, it, if there's nobody here, nobody can conduct business. If you came back, these are automatically in. Yeah, but uh, I'm not sure you understand my question. My question is about the process and how this would work. Uh, I'm, you know, because it doesn't seem, it, it almost violates the Constitution, at no. least it seems to me, because what you're requiring the House to do under this proposal would be to simply uh, make a determination, first of all, that there had been a violation, and secondly, impose a penalty. But you'd have to do that only with a quorum present in the House. And you don't get to do either of those without a quorum being present. Correct? That's not correct because you break quorum today. And we have 50 people here. Right. Section 1 and 2 start. The 3, 4, and 5 are probably what you bring before the body. But then you'd hold, have to be back. Hold on for a minute, though. But you're skipping the step I'm trying to get you to see. And that is that if I'm absent, first of all, somebody's got to make a determination about why I'm absent. That's impeding in the section. Right. We're not and who going makes that determination, like though? Things like that. Who's going to make that determination? Well, I think that if 70 people left together and published it and sent out notices, I think that pretty much meets impeding. Gentlemen's time's expired. Mr. Speaker, could we have an extension? This is so important, I think, to this body because we are traveling down a road, I think, that sort of clashes with our Constitution. The gentleman asked for extended time. This requires unanimous consent. Is there objection? The chair hears none. So ordered. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, members. What I'm trying to get at is, I, I know what it says on the paper, but what I'm trying to understand is, for example, if I'm accused of a crime, somebody makes that, the state makes that allegation that I've been a, committed this crime, right? And what I'm trying to figure out is, in here, when it talks about uh, a member being absent, first of all, just somebody being absent doesn't invoke this. It only gets invoked when somebody makes a determination that the member is absent with an intent to impede the actions of the House. And somebody's going to have to make that determination. That's the body of the House. You could but how can the House conduct that if we can't have a okay. quorum and you can't conduct business? Your questions are two separate. Number one, let's take the isolated absence. You still have a quorum then. Now let's talk about what you're getting at. That's the walkout. You have a quorum break. Now, it's hard for me to see that's negligent. If it's quorum break, that was decided. Now, can you get to what you're saying, three, four, and five? Probably not until members return and you get a quorum. So if 49 people leave, 49 people, you still have 101 people here, right? Does this get invoked? It sure could if there's still a, a, a quorum here. But how could you be impeding if there was a quorum? If you have a quorum here and they think that the 40 left for reasons that impeded House action, this allows the members to raise that in this body. Because they would be in a quorum then, you could conduct business. That's what I said. Right. But if there were 52 people who left, you wouldn't have a quorum and you couldn't conduct business. Until they came back, I keep saying that. When you come back, you have a quorum. You can't act while you're gone, but when you're here, we can. Okay, let me, let me, let me 
take it to its kind of crazy end. Suppose you left a quorum, a quorum break, and the people never came back the rest of the session. Nothing would happen. Is that, is that what I understand you to say? If you have a quorum where there's nobody here under the Constitution, we can't, we can't do any business. But, but, but you couldn't activate this particular rule either, right? You couldn't have a proceeding formally on three, four, and five. Number one and two could be activated. But to impose a fine would seem to invoke at least some due process rights that an individual has to defend themselves against the imposition of the fine. If it's impeding the action. But somebody's got to make that determination. See, you and I again. disagree on this. So I think if 70 of you left, I don't think many people are going to think there wasn't a purpose behind that so that people cannot conduct business here. How long would they have to be gone? Well, that's up to them. I don't know. I mean, if, be, they were gone an, I, if we were gone an hour, for example, would that be impeding? It, it's up to the body of the House when they came back. So, so when, when they came back, the House could... Could, could, would have a quorum then, presumably, and then conduct the business of imposing the fines and making determinations. Correct. Well, the fines, if you're gone, and when you get back, it's decided by the House you impeded, those fines are accumulating. We're not stopping the fines. If they decide you didn't impede it, none of this, affi none of this applies. So they could actually impose retroactively That's fines. That's not retroactive. Pardon? That's not retroactive. Well, yeah, you have imposed a fine when they left, but you can find, you imposed a fine when they came back. You're coming back based on an action that impeded the business of the House in Texas determined by this? That's accumulating. It, you okay. know that going in. All right, I, I, I just think don't I agree with you on the due process. I believe okay. this is due process. Well, I, we disagree about right. that. But, we do. But, but, but let me talk about this. The, the whole process is, revolves around impeding, impeding this House. Can you tell the House what that means in practical terms? Yes, two things. First, since you asked, Article 3, Section 10 says you can have penalties without a quorum. You did what? Article 3, Section 10 says you can have penalties without a quorum. Without a court? Quorum. Quorum, okay. So you ask. I, and and penalties ask, for what, though? Ask, does, it, does, it, does it presuppose that you could have penalties for violating the quorum requirements? I think that you can impose penalties based on what they believe the intent. For example, if you've impeded, and they're going to continue, you can come back and contest it. You have the procedure in here to say, hey, we weren't. I mean, that thing is not, it doesn't stop you from contesting, but it does set out if you make this decision, you have these acts that can apply. And you also have a procedure where if you don't think it is, like you're giving examples, you go to House administration, you make your case, you provide your basis, and there's a procedure there where you could get it reversed. So and the so does House administration here. then do the same thing with that that they do with every bill that comes to House administration? They refer it to calendars and then it comes to the body? Mm -hmm. No, I don't, I don't think, I think some of the House administration procedures don't necessarily all go to uh, calendars. I think they have some actions and actions that start and come from the uh, House administration. But again, I'm talking about this proceeding. Would it no. simply, would it's, House administration be empowered to either impose the penalties or not impose the penalties? They, that was the end of it. They make the report to the body of the House. And what does the body of the House do with it? They then uh, act on it here. They did what? They get to act on it here as a body. Here's the report. Take a vote. But they, don't, they can't do that in, without a quorum. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. That's correct.
Ms. Gervenhoff, I can... <clears throat> May I ask the gentleman questions? For purpose? Yes, ma'am. The gentleman, you for questions. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair, I'm trying to understand on the expulsion, what's the time frame on the expulsions? That's up to whoever makes the request of this body. So there's unlimited. So if we're serving 140 days, you can expel me for 139 days? I don't know what the members would provide the criteria. Oh, so that's up to the membership to vote yes, on the yes. number of days that's an individual I, can be expelled. That, it would be part of what they request. And if I'm expelled, can I also serve on my committees or I can't show up at all? We'll have to see what the expulsion motion is, what the penalties, what they're going to ask happen. So if you're what kicked, do we do it may be a complete, you're kicked out. Kicked I don't out? know. It's up to the members to make that, not me. So the members would vote on the term of my expulsion, the conditions of my expulsion, and so there's nothing set in, in, in the uh, amendment itself. Well, you're asking me, this is a process that's up to the member to present to the House that could be modified, amended by this body. And so if, if, if one wants to come back after being told they're being expelled, is there any uh, rationale laid out of why, why you could come back or you could just be expelled and it's in the story? Okay, expulsion. Let's say that a member was expelled. That member says it was wrong. They go to the section in the motion that tells you to go to House administration. You present all your information. They conduct a report and it provides to each member of the House and it can be stayed, kept, or modified. I can't tell you what a House member would propose about another House member. And it would be the simple majority of the body in terms yes. of what the terms of the, and conditions are? Yes. And so if I say... Well, no, no, no. Expulsion is under a different law. That's constitutional. But the other areas, yes, you'd have a majority. But expulsion is constitutional. So as a duly elected official, I can be ex expelled from the House, which means I cannot serve my constituents, but I'm still an elected official. Well, if that's what they ask. I mean, I, I can't tell you what the motion is. But remember, Constitution, it's already in the Constitution. Rules can't change the Constitution. The expel is two-thirds. So an expulsion, you've got to follow the constitutional requirement. And it would take that for that member. But let's assume you fell into that. Then I would assume you would go to House administration, present your situation. They would investigate, do the report, take your information. And then they would come back to the House, provide all the information to the House, and the House could accept it modify it, do whatever they want. My final question to you, so there any member who's out a week or so, uh, and another member can say that that individual is out for reasons in terms of impeding business, they can make a recommendation for expulsion? If you fall under impeding and you uh, can show that to this body, it's up to this body. And I looked at your amendment and is impeding uh, defined? And if so, what page or what section? Well, I mean, if you look under the, the legal sections that are put in here or go under your, your, the basis of research and law, you can get it. But no, I'm not going to provide 33 different views of impeding. It is a flexible, as you know, under in the world of law, like I am. You use those words so there's flexibility for this House to act. And they may look at impeding as intentional. They may be looking at impeding as forceful, but I don't think you want to restrict it. I think you want this body to be the ones that define it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Speaker. Ms. Collier. Will purpose. the gentleman yield for a question? The gentleman yield for questions. Yes. The gentleman uh, thank you, Chairman Hunter. I just want to ask some clarifying questions about Section G on page 2 that deals with the um, before members expelled under the section. It's going to be referred to House administration. Was there any consideration given to uh, use the General Investigating Committee as opposed to the House, the Committee on House Administration for this particular 
I did, and I talked to members, and I felt that House administration was the proper, because we've done a lot of the House rules pr previously through House administration, and we went through a lot of the past years on that, so I thought that was best. General investigation, as you know, has some general different jurisdictional issues. Well, well they can also investigate a member. Sure. And is, has the Committee on House Administration in the past conducted investigations? I, that I, I don't know. I haven't been on House Administration. Okay. So then my next question deals with the report. The report, is this a report on a recommendation or is this a report on their findings? What, what would the report uh, look like that they're going to present to the well, members? First, it would be up to the Committee on House Administration. On what the report looks like? What it looks like, what it's found, what their findings would be. So Gives them investigation. The All right. So if they have to do an investigation, will they have the authority to hire outside parties to assist in the investigation? It would be up to the chairman and his committee and their budget. So there's no prohibition in this particular amendment that would prohibit the committee from hiring? Because in other committees, there, is that true? There's no prohibition? Well, I mean, the committees I have hadn't prevented me. I'm sorry? So I haven't had any prevention on me in my tenure here. If I need to get extra help, I generally uh, request or use the committee budget, and you generally have an approval process to make sure that the uh, procedure is known, but I've never had anybody prevent it. Okay. And so this investigation, is that going to follow the regular committee rule um, and procedure where it's open to the public and you'll well, take public testimony? This is created generally so that committee can set their own standards and rules like we do for all committees. Well, so the Journal Investigating has very special rules mm -hmm. and there are times where the proceedings are not public. And so I'm just trying to figure out where this lays in between, you know, the general procedure that we have for committees and to the extreme with the General Investigating Committee. I think the concept is not to put, you know, fences, barriers around this. I think it is to get it to the committee, give the committee flexibility to do their due diligence and the flexibility of that committee chair, committee vice chair, and committee members. They may want to do certain things with due diligence uh, that may even be more than what other committees have done. But overall, this is not to, to handcuff, it is to provide general procedures so they can develop and grow from. Is there a time frame on how long they have to do their investigation and then how soon they must submit their report to, for it to be printed the, and provided to each member of the House? There is not a specific time because the idea is to let them to do this comprehensively and basically in a judicious manner. But I think everybody would hope in this House that all committees try to act as quickly as possible, especially if you're dealing with some of these issues. Well, currently there are um, deadlines that have to be met in order for bills to move through the process. And so I'm just trying to figure out if this particular provision would follow those same, uh, you know, procedures. This it, is not the bill procedure. Okay. This is a report. What it says in G, as you've referenced, the matter shall be referred to the Committee on House Administration for investigation and report. They're given flexibility on how to do the report. They're given flexibility on how they do their investigation. Then the report issued under this section shall not be considered until it is printed and provided to each member of the House 24 hours before it's considered on the House floor. So, so what we're trying to do is give them broad discretion on operating. Well, I, I think there, there are times where that's very helpful, but then there's also times where we need a little bit more guidance and, and parameters put in place. And so I'm just a little concerned about this provision. I, I don't support it, but I'm just saying, if we're going to do it, it needs to have, it, it should have some more clarity in terms of what the expectations are in terms of the report 
if it's going to have a recommendation or if it's just going to say, this is what we found, this is who testified, and this is what was presented. Uh, I, I just asking well, for that. I understand that, and we respectfully disagree because we have two different views. My view is to give House administration flexibility. I don't want to put in a bureaucratic framework to the point that it doesn't work. And this is a good procedure that allows the person, the member, an opportunity, gives them a process, as well as the committee to be flexible on the process. So I think it's a pretty good idea. And I, I also have faith in our members and our speaker. The speaker is going to cho choose the people for these committees, and we want the committees to follow the letter of this resolution so that everybody's heard. If it isn't an impeding, that member what? gets to go in there and say, hey, we didn't impede. And it gives the committee an opportunity to almost analyze everything you all have asked. But does a member have the right to participate in the investigation that's under investigated? They go, they'll get, to, it's a, first of all, the entire process is given to House administration. But I believe the answer is yes. Now, the committee will lay out what the members' role and responsibilities are and what the committee's. That's up to them. But is it your intent to have the member participate in the investigation under the House administration? I don't know what you mean, participate in the investigation. Well, I mean, they I've don't have to really include I've never really seen me. people in investigations that are accused and get to participate in their own investigation. So, but this is broad, and it doesn't say that. Well, I think that it's, it says the committee does the investigation. I think we're going a little far, but the idea is, look, I'm not for putting handcuffs on this. I want the flexibility where the member has the opportunity to go to House administration. Give them the tools for the toolbox. And a lot of this evolves right here on the floor because the report comes to everybody here. Every question that you're asking, everything that you're analyzing gets to come out here in these particular proceedings. The bottom line is, if there's no impeding, these don't even start. The whole idea is, let's operate as a house, let's be here, let's get business done. But we've got to have a procedure to handle this, and that's what this is. Thank you. Mr. Speaker? Ms. Collier, what purpose? I'm not sure. I moved to have the exchange between myself and Chair Hunter reduced to writing and placed into the journal. Members, you heard the motion, the objection. Chair, here's none, so order. Ms. Mr. Davis, Speaker. what purpose? Will the gentleman yield for a couple of questions? Will the gentleman yield for a couple of questions? Yes. The gentleman yields. Thank you, Chairman Hunt. I know you believe in representative government, so I want to make sure that we are clear about this amendment. Is it in any way your thought that this amendment would, elim would uh, prevent us from representing our district's wishes as we're being elected by the people in our district? I don't know what yours or other members' district wishes are. You represent your area. But this is a House rule for the House of Representatives. If you do something that you don't believe is impeding, that you're doing something that you think is House district business, you have the opportunity to provide that to this House under this rule. And so in your mind, if our districts or our constituents in our districts ask us to act on a particular piece of legislation, and we choose to support the district's wishes, we wouldn't be, we couldn't get pulled into this kind of de, uh, debate with the House saying we're impeding uh, uh, the business of the House. If, in fact, our constituents have asked us to stand up on a particular issue and we act according to the folks that have elected us to be in this body, would we then be subject to this kind of uh, um, ruling by the House. Well, first, you're I, don't, asking us, I yeah. don't know what the ruling of the House would be, but this is talking about absence impeding the House business. This isn't talking about you filing a bill or representing an issue. But what if you're saying is, is you have people asking you to leave to impede business, 
then I think this clicks in the House rule, and the House has to look at that. So the, so the question is, can our constituents ask us to not favor particular legislation that will do harm to our districts, and that they would rather us not uh, vote on legislation that would do harm to our districts, will we be subject to this kind of uh, treatment? I mean, I'm just trying to understand, because uh, many I, of our constituents it would appear to me that this is a direct relationship to what many of our constituents ask of us to do when legislation does harm to them, either in the committee and or on the House floor. Are you suggesting that this will prevent us from representing those interests? I'm not suggesting any of that, but I, we have a difference of philosophy. I, don't, I have a hard time saying, elect somebody and don't show up. And I don't and think that my view I, is, well, let me finish because I'm responding. My view is what your constituents ask you, you need to make that decision. If you do something that impedes the House business, then that needs to be brought before this House and be considered by this House. So, so is, I can't answer what your House is asking. No, I'm asking district. you from the standpoint of a, we're putting in a process that could potentially conflict with those of us who represent districts who would like for us to stand up. Just as members here, I'm sure they brought this issue to you because they want to represent their interest. The question is whether or not we are limiting our ability for other members to ex exercise the interest of their constituents. In my opinion, no, unless you're impeding, as it says, through absence of the body. But that it, decision you're asking, trying to get an upfront answer, that's not here today. That's when you present the case to this body. And so we, based on what you just explained, we could very well have a situation where we could in fact be acting on behalf of our constituents, and we would just need to tell you, or this committee or the administration, that in fact, this leg legislation is detrimental to our districts, and therefore, they've asked us not to participate on moving that forward. Are you impeding our ability to represent, their di represent our district? That's not what I'm saying. Uh what I'm saying is you're trying to get that this impedes some sort of action in your area. This gentleman's time's expired. The following amendment to the amendment, the clerk read the amendment. Amendment by Martinez Fisher. The chair recognizes Martinez Fisher to explain the amendment to the amendment. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, members, this is an am amendment that uh, is acceptable to the author. It just makes it clear that if we're going to be talking about expulsion in our House rules, that we're doing it pursuant to Article 3, Section 11 of the Texas Constitution, and it is acceptable. Mr. Martinez sends up an amendment to the amendment. The amendment, the amendment is acceptable. The author's objection to adoption of the amendment. The chair has none. The amendment is adopted. Any member wishing to speak for, against, or on the amendment? The chair recognizes. Please vote. Ms. Yes, Jones, for what purpose? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, will the gentleman take yield for questions? Will the gentleman yield for questions? The gentleman yields for questions. Thank you. So my first question is, so the United States Constitution grants us a First Amendment right to protest, so this are you suggesting that this House rule overrides the United States Constitution? No. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you? No. So if the Constitution grants me as a United States citizen, regardless of whether I'm a representative, the right to protest, this rule denies me that right, it penalizes me that, from doing that. Would you agree with that? If I, don't, I don't agree with your analysis. You have the right to protest, but we have the right to conduct 
policy and procedure in the House. This is for the House rules. But no, I'm, the, your constitutional rights to protest, you do that. Nobody so, is talking about that. So you're suggesting with this rule that the House rules supersede our United States Constitution rights to walk out and protest? No, I'm not saying any of that. I can't, may I, may, so we can be penalized, correct? If you impede in the absent procedure, then you have a House rule that applies to you. For purposes of this, my questions, I'll concede that it's for the purpose of impeding to stop votes, just to make this easy. So right? your, for, for, your example is you're gonna walk out. My, my example is, just for questioning, I've made a decision to impede this body, okay. right? I think Good. that you're about to pass some really bad laws. So I exercise my constitutional right to leave, quorum break. You're telling me you believe that the rules in the House will deny me my constitutional right to stop really bad government and the House can punish me by fining me, paying costs to the sergeant at arms, reprimanding me, censoring me, or expulsing me. Would, would you agree that you could do that to me even if I'm impeding and I leave? The House rules pass with this. Those provisions in the amendment apply to you as a House member. To also repeat what was previously said, Article 3, Section 10, which already exists, says you can have penalties without a court. So we have various different laws that already apply. Many of these are already used in certain instances. What we're doing is making this not something that's different, but that something is here for the House. Thank you for that, but that's not really what I asked. Well, no, you're just trying to say you don't like the rule and you want the right to protest. You have no, the right to protest. No, no, I, for purposes of my question to you, I'm saying I'm, I'm trying to stop the House from doing business. I've made that decision. You, and, and I leave. Okay. You're telling me that because I'm if you in the leave, House of... You're if telling you leave me that, and you fall under, like you say, if you're under, if a member is absent without leave for the purpose of impeding the action of the House, then those five things are subject to you. Yes. Okay, so... Maybe I'm not doing a good job of explaining. For, I'm making this easy. I'm, I'm saying that I'm impeding. I'm saying that I decided to leave, right? What I'm saying is, when I leave, this body, because it's the House of Representatives, can find me, make me pay costs by the Sergeant at Arms, reprimand me, censor me, or expulse me from this body that, that's what you're saying. So, the, so, so, so the, the rules in the House supersede the United States Constitution that gives me a right to do something. We do not together agree with your last comment. Do these five procedures come in because you've made an intent to impede? The answer is yes. Do you and I agree that this is taking away some constitutional right? The answer is no. So, and the United States Constitution grants us a right to due process by law, which means fair notice in hearing. So, if I leave and I'm impeding, some penalty, which we've listed, the five, can happen to me without notice in hearing. Again, because I ran for office and got elected by my constituents, I'm not entitled to due process related to what my punishment is? I do not agree. As I explained, there is a process section in the bill. I'll give you an example. 
we had previously talked about the concept of expelling. So let's take that provision. You have a due process procedure. It is presented here, just like we do a lot of things. And then if you are concerned with the action of the House, you go to House administration. They're going to conduct an investigation. They're going to conduct an in a report. They're going to set up their whole procedures. They can decide involving you, getting your input, whatever they want to do. Then they provide a whole report to every member of this House who then makes a determination. It's a pretty good procedure. Let's. I'll keep my thoughts to myself on that one. So, um, and then you've got where if you're assessed a fine that we can't pay from our campaign account, we can't, I guess, use our operating account. So if we had a legal fund account, is that included? If we have a legal defense? Well, I think you better get a lawyer to make sure there's not a political campaign connection to any of those accounts, because you have a whole set of laws that govern contribution expenditure accounts, political campaign accounts, and I don't know how those companies or finance groups are set up. The whole point is you are personally responsible. I, what, I guess my concern with that portion is, what if you're poor? What if you don't have like a big bank account? Because I'd, I'd, I'd hope that to be in the legislature you wouldn't have to be rich. I, I'd hope that poor people could get elected and have constituents. So if my constituents say, do not vote on that, leave, that is not going to help us. And I go do what my constituents say, which is in the course and scope of my, I guess, duties as a state representative. You're telling me that campaign funds can't be used to protect me, sort of like governmental immunity, right? The government does something if you're doing something within the course and scope of your uh, capacity as a governmental entity, you have certain rules to protect you while you're doing that. So now you're forcing, I mean, unless I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, please, that if, I, if I'm not rich, how do I pay the fines? So how does that not discriminate against the poor? Already. Or I should say the poor representative. Already. You have articles. And I'm sorry, I can't hear you because there's talking. I, I don't know what I can do to hear. Members, please take your conversations outside the rail. First of all, you already have articles and sections of the Constitution where penalties can be assessed right now. So what you're talking about is already occurring. Second, let's assume that the fine starts on you. You're going to get hit $500 per day. And if you can't pay it, it's going to come out of your operating account. And then it's going to keep coming out of there till you're able to pay it back. I, so, 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 but therein lies the problem. I can't use my operating account to pay my fine. I can't use my campaign account to pay my fine. But if you find me, you can take it out of my operating account. So I'm just trying to figure out why I can't use my operating account to pay fines, but you can punish me out of my operating account. What? what Help me understand that I, I inconsistency. I don't agree with your analysis. You're not being punished. The rule says... I'm sorry. You... I, Mr. Speaker, I, I really can't hear, and I really want to hear. The gentleman's time's expired. I, I didn't hear what you said, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman's time's expired. We were beyond 10 minutes. Okay, so I'm new. I don't, know what, I don't know what you say if you want to have more time. There's a limit of 10 minutes, and the, t the 10 limit is expired so on do? this amendment. May I have an extension, Mr. Speaker? Members, the gentlelady has asked for an extension of time. Is there objection? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question occurs on the adoption of the amendment as amendment. This is a record of vote requested by Mr. Slayton. The clerk will ring the bell. Chips are Hunter voting aye. 
All members voting. All members voting. There being 87 ayes and 59 nays, the amendment as amended is adopted.